So insulating nowadays has changed a little bit in the last few years because back in the old days, we used to just basically fill a wall cavity full of insulation and it was understood that the wall was officially insulated. But what we've come to understand is, is that insulating now is not just about the material, it's about the whole combination of systems of the home. So now we have the exterior of the house, we've got our, our, our tie par out there, we have the water diversion system on the outside of the house, we can insulate. Now our house just passed electrical inspection, which means we're able to start closing up the walls, which is insulation. You always have to get your electrical inspector before you put your insulation in, which is a key element. Now what I'm doing here is I'm just, I thinned out the insulation thickness to go behind my electrical box here. All right, and I wanted to get all this nice contact down there with the other, there we go. Traditionally, when people are framing, they frame these stud bays so that the insulation already fits. You can buy this stuff in 16 inch or 24 inch widths. The actual inch is actually different, but that's the on center measurement. So when you come over here with your tape measure, you can check, it's gonna say 15, 14, three quarters, something like that. You're close, 15 and a quarter. That means you're buying 16 inch insulation. If it's almost two feet, buy the two foot insulation, okay? Now, insulation itself, the reason this stuff works is it creates a barrier for the cold and the heat to interact. So you're gonna have cold from one side. Let me just see this. We'll have cold from one side and heat on the other side. And somewhere in the middle is gonna be the freezing point. Somewhere in the middle. That's the key. Now the more insulation you put on your wall, the less the heat can travel. You, you drive that freezing point further and further outside the wall. Now, yeah, what you're gonna wanna do when you're installing your insulation is cut around every obstacle that's in the way. Don't tuck it, okay? If you have a piece of wood that's in the way, cut around it, okay? Because that is a really good seal. If I just tuck it, I'm gonna have a gap. And that always is a problem because insulation only works if you don't have air movement. Now the other half of the insulation system is going to be the plastic your vapor barrier. Now, if you live in the north like we do, the vapor barrier goes on the inside of the house. It generally goes on the warm side of the house. If you live in the south, the people will actually make an air barrier that's a vapor barrier on the outside of the house because it's always hot and all they're doing is air conditioning all the time. <laughs> so where you live has a lot to do with how you actually take care of the situation. But for the purpose of this video, we're going to assume that we're installing a climate where we have a furnace and we're going to heat in the winter. Now, you will see you got wire issues, box issues, different framing going on. Everything wants to be tucked together. We're going to go like this. This is actually the area where my hood fan is going to go in my kitchen. All right. Now, I'm going to have all kinds of silly gaps to fill in here. Or I can go sideways make my life a little bit simpler. Whenever you cut insulation, always cut it a little bit wider than what you need so that you can force it in in compression. Okay. Nothing wrong with having wiring inside. If you'd want it tucked away, you peel the insulation open and then just close it around the wire. Nice and simple. Now, this one is going to measure there. And then we'll cut there. And now I've got to get around this. So I've got to cut that. Wow, here we go. Now that's done. We've got to get around this box and here. Now the idea here is you just want to eyeball every one of these elements, okay? Uh, a little bit more. It's nice as a way of doing things. If you're going around an electrical box, leave the back. Have that going behind it. That is a really nice way to take care of that issue. Wow. Boom, boom, boom. 
Now on the market there are basically two different materials. One of them is mineral wool, which we have in the bottom, and fiberglass. They both do the same thing. They create a barrier for the hot and cold meat and create condensation. Now, when hot meat's cold inside a wall, it creates condensation from the moisture that's traveling with the heat, which is why we always put a vapor barrier, so that heat travels without the moisture. It's forced to leave it on this side, so nothing gets wet. This all stays nice and dry. If you're having any concerns with moisture getting through the wall, going to mineral wool is a brilliant idea because that stuff will actually dry out and continue to insulate where fiberglass, once it gets wet, it stays wet and it doesn't insulate anymore. There we go. That stud bay is done. That was a, that's a pretty tricky area to insulate, but you can see how relatively easy it is. Alrighty. Some of the other things you're going to have to do when you're insulating is cutting it to fit the long width here. Okay, so we're going to line this up. I'll show you my little secret. Cut both ends. Okay, here we go. Now, you can use a straight edge to make these cuts. I like a 2x4 because you can compress the insulation. Now, if you cut it the right size, it fits in with just a little bit of compression. If you have to push too much and you end up with that, that kind of a compression, you've done it wrong. Right? Simply peel it out, lay it in, nice and gentle like. You want it nice and fluffy. <laughs> fluffy insulates really well. Now, we're going to get this down here behind the vapor barrier. One of the ways you can measure and cut is you just roll it up. Put a little slice right where the joint is, take it out, and then cut it all the way through. And you'll see it's just a little bit long. Bounce it in there, a little bit of compression, boom. Everything's nicely tight together. Now, the key to successful insulation, it's very similar to uh, the concept like soundproofing, actually. In soundproofing, um, if you have any air moving at all, then if you have an entire wall soundproof, but you have a hole, then you hear the sound clear as day. It's the same with insulation. If you have one weakness, that's going to be where the cold draft comes from. And so having a weakness in your system means uh, you're going to have huge energy costs trying to heat. You're going to have drafts in the room. But most importantly, with those drafts, you're going to have the hot and air mixing. And you're, because we have wood frame construction, you're going to get stuff like this. This kind of rot, this mold, it comes from the wood, the paper got wet, it stayed wet, it didn't get a chance to dry, and that's going to be a problem. So the way that we deal with it is we have to have an entire thermal break system now. We move beyond just insulating, just having the presence of insulation, to having a thermal break system. What that means is we don't just insulate a cavity anymore. Now we have to also make sure that we are able to bring the vapor barrier right from the roof, tied all the way through the wall, around the windows and the doors, through the foundation, right into the basement, continuous. Really, that's the key. Any home that was built before basically 95, year 2000, doesn't have a continuous system. There's all kinds of breaks in the system. The older the house, the more breaks, the less likelihood you even have a vapor barrier, because that kind of technology is relatively new on the market. That understanding is new. Even this one little spot here where my framing is adjusted, I want to tuck it around. There we go. Now you'll see all I do is I put a little mark on the back of the insulation, split it open, get the insulation up and around, and let it envelop the wire. Okay? You can cut around every wire in the house. It's nice and quick. Don't be afraid to use the little bits of offcuts. This, like I said, as long as you're cutting it a little longer than you need it. Well, let's get rid of this junk here. Okay, then you can put piece after piece after piece because it'll fit absolutely perfectly. Now, I've got another wire here. And just peel open some in behind, some in front. 
There we go. That is a nice continuous piece. Once you have all of your insulation installed, you can put on the plastic and then you seal it down. We're going to show you all that in just a minute. Okay, so one of the tricks we got here is this is a balloon frame construction, which means it is really old. <laughs> and there's no top plate. So these studs don't have a top on them. There's no lid in between floors. So what we have here is this cavity. It just continues on and on and on right up to the roof. And then just keep sticking pieces of wood together to, until they get there. Because we're going to be doing some work here in the future, upstairs, I want to actually shove this insulation up that cavity as far as I can go until I get resistance and then just give it a little bit of a gentle tug and let it go snug in there. Okay? Because I want to make sure that I've got really good quality thermal break. Here we go. I'm going to trim back the thickness of the insulation off the front. Ready for this? <laughs> I'm going to tuck this in behind the header that I put in here and get that all the way down in the back. Okay. Now, balloon construction, because of the way it's done, our vapor barrier actually is going to have a bit of a challenge continuing up. So when we cut it, we're going to put it all the way up. But we also want to tie it in all the way down. It's very important when you have an old house like this that you peel back some of your subflooring and you find a way to get your vapor barrier to be continuous. And I'm going to show you the way that it's built and the way that we fixed it, you just come with me over here. So now you can imagine 140 years ago when they built this house, you know, they have all the, the, the studs, okay, they, they've got all the outside, outside boards here, there's two layers of it. So this is the exterior siding. And by doubling it up, they help to create a water diversion system by getting rid of the gaps, it helps close up the air blowing through. But before they put the wood on, they actually installed this paper. Now this is really thick. This is the original concept for an air barrier. It's a really rigid cardboard. And they would put all that across and on the inside they even put some of the lath and nailed it over to close up the gaps, try to reduce the amount of air blowing through. But because the technology and the understanding was just so poor back then, they'd have the guy that put the flooring in come inside the stud base, right? Now that totally interrupts the thermal break. There's no such thing as an interior vapor barrier. And so any air that's pushed through this wall either now or in the future because of rot and mice infestation or whatever reason, it's just coming right into the room, especially around the floors. And let's face it, when the air and the draft is bad around the floors, the house just feels cold all the time. So, what we're going to do to solve this problem is we're going to take our saw and we're going to cut this back because underneath here, there's just a 2x4 attached to the studs that these are nailed onto. By removing that 2x4, we can have access to the stud bay right to the foundation we're going to insulate, we're going to put that vapor barrier all the way down to this foundation and wrap it around so that we can have a continuous system right from whatever we do in the basement all the way up to the attic in the future. So we're going to show you, this is the other side of the wall here, what we've actually done. Okay, so let me just show you what's going on here. Here is the 8x8, eight eight. it's a beam that was placed on the exterior stone wall and then there's a gap and then there's an interior stack stone wall and it has a great big 2x6 sitting on it. And they put these concrete blocks and the trees on top of that. That combination of construction really makes it difficult to get a good insulation and vapor barrier. So what we did is we insulated these stud bays, got our plastic, we brought it nice and long. So we're coming down across this. This plastic we can actually trim and use acoustic seal around the stone front blocks on top of our new mineral wool that we're gonna lay across the top. And then we're gonna tie it together with this insulation blanket that's in the basement and we're going to overlap this plastic and get a good tape seal and hopefully that will help to create a, probably about a 98 percent air barrier it's not going to be perfect but the way the house is built we're not going to get perfect the goal here is to go from i would say when i bought the house 30 percent efficiency up to about 95 to get all that insulation and vapor barrier sealed up so we don't have air moving back and forth from the outside and then we're gonna have a nice comfy winter. <laughs> so before everybody sends your questions in and comments going, oh my God, how's he playing with that insulation? He doesn't have any gloves on, he's not wearing a mask. The truth is the fiberglass pink, it's EcoTouch technology, relatively new on the market, where it allows you to work with this stuff without dying, right? Traditionally, insulation was absolutely horrible. 
The old yellow stuff had actual chunks of glass, not just fibers. Um, this is actually pretty comfortable to work with for the most part. Now, it's difficult for me to talk on camera wearing one of these diapers, so I'm going to put it on now, finish this on a time lapse. But just so you know, if you're working at home, wear a mask. Don't be crazy. But this stuff is actually pretty comfortable to work with, and I don't ever have the need to wear gloves. So just keep that in mind. Now, if you are working with insulation that's driving you crazy, when you're done, wash your arms under cold water. You'll be fine, too. All right, so let's get to the time lapse. When we're done this, we'll talk about vapor barrier and all the tips and tricks for installing that because it's incredibly important to do it right. Ow! Oh, so before we start the time lapse, one more thing. Um, ah, oh, that's better. People are going to ask, you know, what kind of insulation should I use? Uh, what R value, that sort of thing. R value all relates to the thickness of the insulation. So it comes with a label 12, 14, 20, and whatever, whatever. That all depends on the installation situation. If you have a two by four wall, you're going to be going R12. If it's an old house like this, you can bump it up to R14 if they carry it in your store. Most new home construction is R20. And the new standard, because it's made with two by six, the new standard is whenever your house is framed upstairs, you need to frame your house downstairs. So if you're finishing a basement and you have two by six walls in your house, and you can check just by measuring the thickness of your window. If you have two by six walls upstairs, you've got to frame with two by six walls downstairs or at least leave that five and a half inch space from the wall to the finished framing so you can use an R20 insulation there. Otherwise, when the inspector comes, he's not gonna be happy. He's gonna make you fix it all up. Uh, one more thing. Um, I've worked with three kinds of insulation, the pink, the white, and the mineral wool. And I'm just curious to have a conversation in the comment section down below. What is your favorite and why? Keep in mind that we're talking about insulating for a thermal break on the exterior of a house. So I don't want to have too many people talking about how mineral wool is fireproof. If you have a fire and you have exterior insulation made of mineral wool, it isn't going to make a difference at the end of the day what the result is. The rest of the house is going to burn down before your exterior walls do. It's still getting bulldozed and starting over. So let's talk about your favorites and why. Keeping in mind that fiberglass pink is usually less than a third of the cost of mineral wool. Time for the time lapse. Well, while we're here talking about this stuff, I'll just show the uh, products we're gonna use. Um, one of it is a staple hammer. This is nice because staples driven, right? Uh, T50 staples. I like using 3 8 on my vapor barrier. It seems to be the perfect blend of long enough but not too long that you don't have to hit it too hard. You're going to want a marker. You use the black marker on the plastic and then you're good to go. Of course, you're going to need some tuck tape. This is to seal plastic to plastic in areas where there is no wood. You want to use acoustic sealant. There's a lot of varieties. I think I have some mono here as well. It's all the same stuff. This basically never dries. It's a real, real nasty black goop. And you put this between two layers of plastic and press it together, or you can put it on the wood, like we're gonna use around all of the floor joists. We're gonna fill all those cavities with this stuff and then press the plastic into it to create an air seal. Every one of those little roof cavities. Now that detail is gonna be time consuming, but it's gonna be worth it because that'll kill all the drafts in the house. And you're going to want to have some fresh blades because when you're cutting plastic, you want a nice sharp blade. You get cut when you're working with a dull blade. Every time your blade has got a nick in it or something, it snags a plastic, you get an extra tug. That's when you're going to hurt yourself. So make sure you're working with sharp blades. This is going to be kind of like a tutorial. I'm going to show you some tips and tricks for if you're doing this on your own because installing vapor barrier, generally speaking, can be a real frustrating for a lot of people if you haven't done a lot of it. So I've got a few tricks up my sleeve I'm going to share with you. You get a few thousand square feet for just pennies of glass, right? It's not that expensive. So when you're measuring out your vapor barrier, be generous. It's easier to trim it off if you have too much than to try to fuss around with something if it's almost not quite there. Just maddening, right? So what we're going to do is measure the wall, cut our plastic a little longer than we need it, and I'm going to show you how to stick it in. So this is really simple, four feet. 8 feet, 12 feet, 16, and 3 is 19. 
I'm going to throw an extra foot on each side, so I'm going to cut it at 21. Now, there's a lot of ways to do that. That board is almost seven feet long. All right. Seven feet. Fourteen feet. Twenty-one, yeah, and a little bit. Never hurts to have a little extra. Okay. Before we get started, we're just going to check to make sure that our tools are properly loaded. We got lots of staples in here, and we are good to go. It just snaps into place. Pull it down, and release. Mm -hmm. That's how that works. So the secret in doing your vape barrier, generally speaking, is you're going to be working in a dirty area. You want to unravel this so you stay on the clean side so it's draped over your head while you're working. You're not getting covered in filth and dirt and getting it in your eyes. Vape barrier generally comes in 8 or 10 foot lengths plus a few extra inches. Okay, So we have an 8 foot wall here, but we're also doing our rim joist. That's why we added the bottom first so that we can tape that seal. So we're using an eight foot piece of plastic. And the goal here is to install it so that we're just gonna have an overlap here of a couple of inches. Now, let me show you how to do this so you can keep it level. Here's my clean side, all right? Get underneath it. And unravel all that extra plastic. <laughs> And you want to have about an extra foot past your corner. Okay? Kind of like surfing, Max. You gotta get inside the inside the wave. Okay. So what I'm doing here is I'm for the purpose of the camera, I'll try to get a little more awkward. I'm gonna be having it about a foot out of the corner. Okay? And just a little bit higher than I need it. And I'm gonna put one staple right there. Just to hold that spot. Now we get tricky. Now, if you hold on to your old boxes, uh, garbage boxes, staple boxes, stuff like that, then you're gonna love this next trick. There's a crease in the plastic. And what you wanna do is you wanna have that looking like it's somewhat level, all right? And when it's somewhat level, you wanna go like this on that crease right where that cardboard is. Once you got your staple on that crease, throw a few in there. What this does is it gives you the ability to go to the other end of the room and stretch the plastic out and make sure it's all perfect. La -da -da -da. We know we're gonna have extra, right? Now I cut it extra long on purpose just to overemphasize the point. There we go. Now, now, here we are. I'll let you just get an idea. You can see those creases now, right? You can see that they're starting to look pretty, per pretty parallel. Now, I'm going to grab the plastic right on that crease where I've got my staples on the other side, and I'm going to pull it as tight as I can. I'm gonna grab another piece of cardboard. Now, this is the perfect time to step back and take a look at your work. You can actually see, because I stapled on the crease in the plastic, that looks pretty darn good, right? This is where the easy part comes in. Now we're staying on the clean side. And we are going to just stretch this up towards the ceiling. And this is kind of like ironing your clothes, right? Every step, you're just pulling towards the outside, okay? Pulling down, looking for nails or screws. You flip this around to the hammer side, okay? If there's anything left in that wood, you want to take care of it right now. Now, here's the plastic from the bottom, okay? That overlap there is going to be pretty darn healthy. 
what we're gonna do is we're gonna staple above that joint for now. All right, now I've seen a lot of guys over the years and they put a staple every two inches. They'll go through a whole box of staples on a wall and that's just not necessary. Remember, you wanna have a good seal for anything that's penetrating the vapor barrier, but the plastic itself doesn't have to be tight to the wood because when you install the drywall, everything will be compressed. So this is just to get everything in place that's all we're doing here so that we can make things easy to work with. All right, we don't have to go crazy with staples. It's one of those things where if you use too many, you'll end up running out and then you're gonna have a trip to the store. <laughs> and then that one little $4 box of staples ends up costing you $50 and wasted time and gas and everything else. So be smart. Now, there we go. Working up, pulling up and out. Okay, so here what you need to do is think about your strategy. Now because it's bloom construction, my studs are not in line with my joists, they're offset. Um, what we're gonna use is we're gonna use this surface of the stud for pressing plastic into the insulation acoustic sealant. We're gonna have a sealant coming across the floor and then down and around the joist again. So when I cut my plastic, I want to have it kind of fitting right into this corner. Okay, so what I'm going to do, just slide my knife in here. Okay, remember I talked about having a sharp knife? I'm going to cut straight towards myself. That's not terrible. A little crappy at the end, but all right for now. And over here, we're going to do the same thing on this cut right off that joist. Oh, there we go, talking about that sharp knife business, right? Okay, so now I've got a piece of plastic that will go up here onto that wood, onto that ceiling, and there's still like an inch and a half or whatever to wrap around this wood. Now you'll see here, there's gonna be an issue, right? So what we do is we stretch this out, take your knife and give it a bit of a nick, okay? So that the plastic will wrap around that joist. We're gonna throw a staple in it, add a little red tape when we're done if we need to. Now, this stuff is crazy messy. I mean, it does a great job, but it is incredibly messy. So put a nice angle on it and put it on in such a way that you're gonna be able to leave it on the wall without wearing it, okay? Because this has gotta be one of the messiest substances known to mankind. All right. And this isn't a situation here where um, close is good enough, okay? Uh-oh, I'm dripping everywhere here. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. There we go. Close is not good enough with this stuff. You want this to be everywhere. It won't seal. There's not enough there to press into. <laughs> okay. And here we go. Both sides at the same time. Stay on the clean side, right? Press it into the corner. Cross the top, make your life a little easier. Throw in a couple of staples in those key intersections. Okay, loving it. Now, we're gonna get this pressed in there. Beautiful. And we got a whole lot of extra plastic here, right? I'm gonna suggest whenever you have extra material, get rid of it. It's easier to see what's going on and to do a little quality inspection if all of this junk is out of the way. Mindful of the blade. There we go. Now, that actually is quite good. Oh, some of it gooped out where the staple went through. Nice. Once again, now I have a seal. I've got drywall going here. It's going to be under compression. I got my black all the way up and around the wood, right around the joist cavity over to here. Now this black stuff doesn't come off very well. Gasoline works, WD-40 works, um, give it three or four days works. But generally speaking, if you're concerned about that, uh, wear clothes that you can afford to throw in the garbage um, or wear some disposable gloves and keep changing them out. Always have a place where you can put your acoustic caulking in a corner on a scrap piece of wood 
That way, if uh, it leaks all over the place, you can throw that in the garbage and you aren't going to end up walking through globs of it all over the house and track it through the rest of your house. That would be a disaster. Anyway, that's pretty much the whole process. And the only other kind of penetrations we have to deal with now is how to tape down everything else. So let's go through that. So right here I've got a window. It's kitchen counter. And where we are, if it's more than four feet of counter, you need two plugs, but it can be on the same 12-2 wire. That's nice. So I put in two different boxes on the same circuit so I can demonstrate how to seal both of them up. Box number one. This is awesome because this has a plastic flange with a rubber gasket on it. And here's how I do box number one. I simply cut the plastic right on the inside of the box. Okay. And then I stretch that plastic around that and that's done. Now when I put the drywall on, it's compressed around this box and this gasket and it is going to be perfectly sealed. Box number two does not have the flange. Tighten all this up. You're going to cut the inside of the box. You're going to stretch it around the box. But now we have to tape it to the box. Okay. So start with your tape about a quarter inch above the box. Cut it and it'll peel. Fold over the edge so you can find it again in a second. And then what you do with your tape is now you're pressing it into the plastic. Okay. And then just give it a little nick in the corners. Oh, didn't grab it. There we are. Now you can do this and use this as much as you need. The idea is to get the tape to tape around the, the exposed quarter inch edge of that box. I know it sounds a little bit ridiculous, but trust me when I say this, if you don't seal these up properly, you're going to have air moving around your electrical circuits and you're going to get a draft and you're going to get condensation there and you're going to get mold appearing on your wallboard just behind your, your countertops. All right. That's not something that you want. There we go. Now that's frustrating. It takes tape. That box costs about $2 a piece more. I'll let you decide if it's something you want to fuss around with, but they both work. Now they're both going to be air sealed. That's awesome. That's how you handle that. Down here on the bottom, we have an option to seal down here. Okay. We can get the black goop. We can peel the plastic back like this, put a line, lay it over top and press it in or because we work nice and clean and that's a factory edge, we can just take our tape and press it in like that. Okay. Now our vapor barrier is continuous down to the basement. Our vapor barrier up top is continuous and sealed to the subfloor upstairs. And when we continue the work upstairs at a later date, we'll be able to seal the vapor barrier to the floor from the other side. And that'll give us a perfect air seal throughout the entire wall, right through the foundation. <laughs> That's about all we're going to need to know for installing the plastic and the tape, except for the windows. Now, this is the last place where you're going to have to learn a secret or two. So let's get into this. We want to staple the plastic around the frame. Okay. Again, the drywall is going to do most of the work here, but having that plastic stretched tight gives you, makes it a lot easier to cut this all up. Now we're going to be changing these windows out. That'll be the next video, but for now, I'll show you how to do the plastic. You have a window jam, you have expansion foam. That foam is an air barrier from the jam to the stud. Okay. So there's no air leaking here. So when you're cutting your plastic, you don't have to do anything fancy here and try to tape it onto the window jam. I know a lot of people do that because when they buy a new house, they'll see in the basement, they've got vinyl windows and they always use the red tape and tape the plastic right to the window. It's the ugliest thing and it shouldn't be allowed, but they're just lazy. What we need to do here is cut the plastic just to the side of your expansion foam between your stud. Okay. Right there. That's what you're looking for. And I'll show you why in a second. Cut the extra plastic away from the window. And there we go. 
Now you've got two options when you install your drywall, you can trust that it's going to create compression. But if you really want to make sure that you don't have air leaking around your windows, take your staples off now, grab your goop, okay, and just get a thin bead here. It doesn't have to be a lot, just enough to make contact. And this stuff is awesome for areas where you've got inconsistencies in the surface height. Okay, well, pull it tight. Now, just gently come back and press that on. Okay. There you go. Now we got a good air seal. Woohoo! Right? No tape necessary. Use the goop, press it in. When you're done, if you want to just for extra measure, you can throw a couple staples back on. All right? Problem solved. That is a perfect way to have a complete thermal and air and vapor barrier system in your home, no matter how old your house is. Wow, so if that information is all helpful to you and you're planning a major renovation project, then remember the devil is in the details here. If you want to learn more about how to renovate your house, then click the link here and you can follow along from the beginning on our 1880s farmhouse restoration project. I'll see you in the comments below.